Morning, everybody. Morning. It's lovely to see you. You know, today is a very beautiful day, beautiful weather, and beautiful people, and a beautiful day. One of the things to remember about the Day of Atonement is that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ did not happen on the Day of Atonement. But let's focus on the Day of Atonement. 1 John 4, verse 10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is what we are celebrating. Jesus Christ came as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love is the basis of atonement. So we are celebrating a love story. God's love story with humanity. 1 John 2 and verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So this is a day we set aside to celebrate God's love for the whole world. What does it mean to make atonement? To atone is to make amends for what is wrong, to put right what is wrong. Question is, do we really know what has gone wrong with humanity's relationship with God? We all have a different per per perception of this. We know it has got to do with sin. We will address that later. Consider 1 Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Colossians 1, 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from all creation, over all creation. By him all things were created. We are talking about Jesus Christ here. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. With the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Every single person was created by God, for God, to have a relationship with God. Our God is a relational God. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Consider further this section, verse 18 to 20 of Colossians 1. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. That is what we are celebrating whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Continuing Colossians 1, 21 and 22, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, sin. But now, what is our standing with God? He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. This is loaded information, my brethren, loaded. We need to really focus on it, to come to grasp it and to change our thinking. Metanoa, repentance, is more powerful than dynamite. If you understand this, you will understand how loving our God is and you will grow in his love. Do you see it? Consider further. Why is this so? Because it is good news, the gospel. Verse 23 reads, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you've heard, that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The tabernacle gives a picture of our need for the atoning sacrifice, sacrifice to God. God is represented by the glory crowd, dwelling in the holy place, but he is with us. 
people are seen outside the gate god is inside and we are outside every entry and all the furniture between us and god all picture are alienation and the various aspects of the person and the work of the blessed lord jesus we need to think about it let's look at it here is the tabernacle and there is god's presence signified by the cloud of smoke and there is the is the altar in which sacrifices were offered the people are outside the priesthood is inside there it it pictures our alienation from god hebrews 7 verse 18 to 21 the former regulations which were there in what i just showed you in the picture is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to god now i think our understanding has grown because of the years through which we fasted and we had two services sometime um, for a long time on the day of atonement but we have come to understand in new new kind of things are better it was not without the um, uh, what am i saying here the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless and now this this regulation involved the priesthood involved the offering of lambs and goats and the shedding of blood by which uh, we draw near to god it was it was not without an oath uh, others became priests without an oath but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Jesus Christ was on the, from the tribe of what? Judah. Was he not? The priesthood was not the, the, the tribe of Judah, it was the tribe of Levi. Hebrews 7 verse 22, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant under which we live. Now there has been many of those priests since death pre prevented them from continuing in office. As one generation passed and the priest died, another generation took over. And one of those priests was Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. He is also dead. He doesn't offer the sacrifice anymore. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Very important to bear in mind these principles outlined for us in the scriptures therefore he is able to save completely those who come to god through him because he always lives to intercede for them this is our hope such a high priest meets our need the one who is holy blameless pure set apart from sinners and exalted above the heavens Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people that were pictured by the tabernacle we saw and the altar and the incense burning and the sacrifices being offered. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints a high priest, men who were weak. But the oath which came after the law appointed the son who was being made perfect forever. That's Hebrews 7 verse 26 to 28. Hebrews 7, 8 verse 1 and 2. The new reality of God. The point of what we are saying is this. We do have a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. The Levitical high priest could not sit down in the, in the throne. He had to come out very quickly after throwing the blood on the, um, on the uh, mercy seat. And he and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord and not by man. This is our reality. This is what we are celebrating. Our reality is different to that of the old covenant high priest did. Hebrews 8 verse 3 to 6. Every high priest is appointed to offer 
both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest because there is already there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at the sanctuary that is a copy of the shadow which is in heaven. By the ministry Jesus has received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the to the old one and is founded on better promises. We celebrate the new reality, atonement Christ made us perfect. That is what we are celebrating. <coughs> Hebrews 10 verse 1 to 2. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeatedly, endlessly, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to, near to worship. We were never made perfect by fasting and by the sacrifices offered at the altar. If it could, they would not have been stopped being offered. For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty of their sins. Hebrews 10 verse 3 to 6 But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice, Sacrifices and offerings you do not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sacrifices you were not pleased. Hebrews 10, continuing in verse 7, 7 to 9. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and, offer and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. So we live under the second new covenant. Can you grasp this fabulous truth? This is what we are celebrating. Hebrews 10 verse 10. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, we would read these scriptures, but they would just fly over our head. It never sank into our hearts. And we need to remember that. Did you notice by Jesus coming to do God's will, we have been made holy? We are God's holy people. These are not my words. These are the words from the scriptures, inspired scriptures. Now, Max Lucado wrote this, which is a beautiful presentation of what I'm talking about. A great curtain hung as a reminder of the distance between God and man. It was like a deep chasm. God could have left it like that. He could have, you know, but he didn't. Continuing, the annual event always drew a crowd. The priest would solemnly ascend to the temple steps, not only when the temple stood, that is, bearing the blood of the sacrifices as the people waited outside. He would pass through the great curtain and enter the Holy of Holies. He would sprinkle the mercy seat above the ark and pray that the blood would appease God. The sins would be rock, rolled back and the people would sigh with relief. When the high priest came out, there was a rejoicing in Israel every year. The great curtain hung as a reminder of the distance between God and man. It was like a deep chasm that no one could bridge. Man in, on his island, quarantined because of sin, God could have let, left it like that. He could have left people isolated. He could have washed his hands off the whole mess. He could have turned back, tossed in the towel and started over on another planet. He could have, 
you know, but he didn't. God himself breathed the chasm in the darkness of, the, of an eclipsed sun. He, the Lamb, stood in the Holy of Holies. He laid the Lamb on the altar, not the Lamb of a priest or a Jew or a shepherd, but the Lamb of God. The angel thus, as the blood of the sufficient sacrifice began to fall on the golden altar. I am emotional when I think about this. Where the blood dropped of lambs, now, uh, where the blood of, uh, dropped of lambs, now dripped, dropped the blood of life, the blood of the Lamb of God. And then it happened. God turned, looked one last time at the curtain. No more, and it was torn from top to bottom when Christ died. Ripped in two, no more, no more curtains, no more sacrifices. No more separation, and then the sun came out. This is what we are celebrating. How wonderful is our loving God. Atonement is not some legal transaction to appease a God angry with us because of sin. In the gospel, atonement declares to us that in, that in and by the entire life, finally on the cross, Jesus destroyed our alienation. Enslavement, corruption and false humanity brought about by Adam's and humanity's independence and alienation. That alienation, as we sang in the song that we sang, you know, we can't go up into the heavens or down into the earth or deep into the oceans. We are never separated from God. Our false perceptions of God that thought we are separated from God. By the loving command of the Father, Jesus undid Adam's fall. Taking on the form of man, he became just like you and I. He lived your life and my life. He was tempted in all points like we are. I am reading scripture, but they are not on this slide. Taking on the form of a man, he nailed us to the cross. Destroyed the enmity, made reconciliation for us. This is what we are celebrating. Notice how it is explained by Paul. Colossians 2, verse 9 and 10, 9 to 11. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised, and in putting off your sinful nature, not with the circumcision done with the hands of men, but with the, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Continuing on in Colossians 2, 12-14, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. Having cancelled the written code with its regulations that were against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Continuing verse, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, new moon, or a celebration on Sabbath day. Why? These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. That is, the, we are celebrating the reality we have been, we have found in Jesus Christ. The fall of Adam, his plunge into darkness and chaos and wrong-headed thinking of God did not mean God was through with man. It meant, however, that God had a prob problem of communication, communicating with fallen man. Whatever God said, revelation though it was, would be misunderstood by man. 
God the Father knew before the creation that his beloved son would have to enter Adam's world to save it from ruin. This is the reason for the incarnation. So God calls Abraham and establishes a nation and begins the long and necessary painful relationship make to make this happen. I talked about this uh, when I last spoke here about the truth of Israel. They were God's tools to, as we will see in a moment, he first gave the law through Moses to check the chaos of the fall and to help Israelites to begin to understand that there is a serious problem. All the, all the sacrifices didn't take away their sin. The problem was an ongoing problem. And the Israelites were supposed to learn that lesson. And we, as we study the scriptures, learn that we can never make it with our brokenness. This is the reason for the incarnation. Law, however, was never the point. The point was that God and Israel are in relationship. The living God was drawing near to fallen Adamic creation in the people of Israel. The calling of Israel was not about God's dispensing accurate information about himself so that the Israelites could have good theology. That was not the reason. The call of Israel was about the living God re-entering into contact, into living fellowship and relationship with fallen Adam. God is committed to reconciliation. We can see that in the story of Israel. Do you see the, the heart of God? Do you sense the goodness of God and his heart for you and I and for all of humanity that began with the people of Israel? Israel had to bear what was not normal for fallen man, have a real relationship, not with the law, but with God himself. On the one side was God with abounding love and joy and fellowship. On the other side was fallen, corrupt, enstained, alienated Israel. Again and again in their history, Israel bolted to the door. But the goodness of God, the love, the joy, the fellowship of God was too much for fallen Israel with a carnal mind to bear up it. But this is how Israel became the womb of the incarnation and the bearer of God's revelation to us. This was necessary and this necessary and painful ordeal of God's relationship with Paul and Israel produced two great realities. First, a bridgehead was established inside the mind of fallen humanity, a bridgehead that God is talking and in relationship with these people. The creative genius of the spirit began to penetrate Israel's paganism, wrong-headed knowledge about God through divine revelation. It was intended to act as a refining fire, burning away Israel's thinking and being. The living word wrestled with Israel's fallen mind and began to clothe itself in human thoughts and concepts and ideas. <coughs> The concept of covenant, God in agreement with man, covenant is an agreement. That came to God's relationship with Israel, did it not? We need to understand the history of scripture, uh, of faithfulness to God and God's faithfulness to Israel. Sin, what it does to that relationship. The priest, the, uh, the sorry, the, uh, sin, atonement and mercy. Community, the community of God, the priest, the prophet and the king, which would become the eternal essential furniture for our knowledge of God was beginning to be shaped in the life of Israel's relationship with God. Through 
the divine revelation, these concepts would become the pair of glasses through which we, the, we as fallen humans, begin to see the truth about God and enter into living and meaningful relationship with the Father. Second, the real presence of God in the midst of fallen Israel created the stir that would become the matrix or the surrounding circumstances of the incarnation itself. In Israel, the living word was already on the road to becoming flesh. Why? Because revelation means nothing less than the unveiling of God himself. Not just the truth about God, but unveiling of God himself. That's why Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Revelation then presses for response and in knowing and fellowship and, and embodiment. This would not allow Israel to sweep its brokenness under the carpet. That's why they had to have that relationship going on for years and years. The real presence of God in Israel stirred up all sorts of conflict as the infallibility of God brought the fall of Adam to the service and created the fight of fights. This conflict between God and Israel is nothing less than the prehistory of atonement and reconciliation, the impossible union between God and humanity. Fallen Adam, humans, in and through Israel, were being summoned into the presence of the Lord and called to take real steps into the fellowship of the fellowship with the true and living God. This, was, this also began to signal the end of fallen Adamic existence and the formation of the new man, the second Adam, through death and resurrection. It sing, signaled and pointed to the new covenant, to Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit to all humanity and the coming of the kingdom of God. But more than this, the conflict created by the unveiling of God to fallen Israel establishes the womb of the Incarnation itself. It created the living situation into which the Son of God would be born. These are deep thoughts. They need prayerful consideration, careful thought and prayer and con carefully considering what I am saying to you in the scriptures because I am basing this on what God has shown me from the scriptures. Notice how Paul explains this to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 16. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. When Christ died, we died. Even I died actually before we were even born. But that's part of the story. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for, the, for, for him who died for them and was raised again. So we are to live for God. So from now on we regard no, no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once uh, regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, 19 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God, not from any priest or pastor telling you a story. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is the ministry given to us. That God was reconciling the world to himself in trust, Christ, not counting men's sins against them, whatever they do. For he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now, when we see the mess of the world, it shouldn't discourage us. God is not discouraged. He has already done what is necessary to reconcile the world to himself. And we are to tell the world 
God loves you and has done everything necessary for you to come to know Him. Humble yourself, change your thinking and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. That is our commission. 2 Corinthians 5, continuing verse 20 to 21. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We, it is profound, isn't it? It's profound. It is just not ideas of men, it is the thought and the heart of God that is being communicated to us through the Apostle Paul who was sent to open the eyes of the blind and to show what God is like. This is the plain truth as he used to say in the past. This is the plain truth of Scripture. The atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ reconciles us to God. Through the incarnation, life, ministry, death and resurrection, ascension and the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, God was destroying the old man with his enmity and hostility and making a new man. Notice Ephesians 4 verse 22, 23. Peter, would you read Ephesians 4 verse 23 and 24? That's all right. Sorry, Peter. Ephesians 4, verse 23 and 24. Uh, where are we? Um, Ephesians 4, 23. To be made new in attitude of your mind and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 2 verse 20 to 23. You know, this takes a lifetime to, be, to become like Jesus Christ, to let this mind be in you. Colossians 2 verse 20 to 23. Since you died with Christ to the eternal, uh, to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Mm. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Thank you, Peter. This is good news. Notice Romans 6, verse 3 to 7. Peter. to seven, sorry. Um, well, don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism, in, baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the, through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. Mm. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, and we was, should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Thank you, Peter. Galatians 2, verse 20 and 21. These things take a lot of meditation and thinking an application in our lives, to yield to God's mind, to let God change our thinking and our lives. Galatians 2 verse 20 and 21. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could have been gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Yeah. So these things remind us of what, what we are constantly to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 17. This is real peace with God. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 17. This is a long reading, Peter. Okay. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Mm. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self and, uh, with its practices and have put on the new self which is being re renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns and songs, from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, you know, fasting was to remind us to deprive ourselves of our false humanity and our wrong ways and to feed ourselves on the right things of God. This is what fasting was meant to do. And we as Christians, we don't necessarily need to fast, but we need to put on the righteousness in the mind of Jesus Christ. We need to grow in his grace and in his knowledge. Notice Paul explained the implications of this in his word, into in, the world in Romans, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Continuing, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near, made at one through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. This is what we are celebrating. Very deep thoughts, very important, very fundamentally important to our lives. 
the amazing love of the father was brought to light by the son Matthew 11 verse 25 and 30 Jesus said that when we know this and come to the good shepherd then the Holy Spirit will open our eyes to come to know the truth of Jesus words and his work Matthew 25 Peter verse 20 Matthew 11 verse 25 to 30 At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and have revealed them to little children. Mm. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from, from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Mm. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Mm. John 5, verse 19 to 27. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raised the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, so that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, because he, uh, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the, so the voice of the Son of God and those who hear him will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Thank you, Peter. Also John 6. John, sorry, John 14, verse 6. He is not in my notes, I'm sorry. Uh, John, John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pause for a moment. What does atonement mean? Access to God, is it not? Relationship with God. And we are being told, no one knows the Father except the Son. No one comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus Christ is our atoning sacrifice. Verse 20, Peter. On that day you will realize that I am in the Father and, and you are in me mm. and I am in you. Thank you. So this truth is what we are celebrating. It's, it's, it's a very profound knowledge. It's important that we grasp it, but this is the truth about God's love for humanity and what he has done to reconcile us to God through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God bless you.